This is episode 236 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined this week by Jeff Bird. He is a public regulation commissioner here in the state of New Mexico. And we're going to talk about a lot of issues happening at the New Mexico PRC. And uh, thanks for joining us, Jeff. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. Yeah. So if, uh, if we have any technological issues, including broadband problems during this show, we can blame you and your PRC, right? Yeah, why not? Pile on. <laughs> All right. Good. Glad that we've got that cleared up. Uh, of course, using uh, Zoom and other online technologies. So it could be Steve Jobs. It could be uh, whoever the guy that invented Zoom is, and they're probably rolling in it right now. But, uh, you know, Jeff, uh, before we get too far down the tracks here, talk a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, how you came to be on the PRC and what area of our fine state you represent on that particular board. Well, I live near Tucumcari. I have been an environmental engineer. I housed out of Texas most of my life, but in 2000, I moved to Artesia, New Mexico, where I worked for Navajo Refinery and the pipeline, uh, Navajo pipeline there. Um, I became a commissioner under the urging of my former commissioner, Pat Lyons. Uh, because I have an engineering degree, I've worked in the regulated industries, um, and I, I think it was a good fit. I, I wasn't sure if he was right at the time, but um, I, small business owner, we regulate small businesses, we regulate pipelines. As we all know, we regulate the IOUs, the electric companies, and yes, I did work for them as an environmental engineer. Um, the district that I represent is District 2, which is the east half of the state. So all are part of 17 counties from Otero, near El Paso to Colfax County, which is up at Raton. All right. And, uh, you know, people often hear about the PRC. It's uh, definitely been in the news a lot recently. But can you briefly tell us how the PRC works in New Mexico and what its portfolio. So we regulate pipeline safety, transportation companies that are intrastate, the ones that just move within the state, like taxi companies, ambulance services, and moving companies that within a city or county. Um, we regulate the electric companies. We kind of regulate co-ops, but because they're uh, investor owned or publicly owned by the users, they regulate themselves through the board. And the only way, the, the main way that we regulate them is if there's a complaint, then it's brought before the commission to hear the complaint and decide the proper uh, way to move forward on those complaints. We also regulate any utility. So the gas companies, water companies that are privately owned, but we do not regulate city utilities. They're on their own. Uh, we don't even, we don't have anything to do with cities. Um, so that's the main thing we regulate. And what everybody hears about the most and what affects everybody the most is electric rates. And that is probably 80%, I bet, 75, 80% of the issues that come before the commission are dealing with the three IOUs, which is PNM. El Paso and SPS. And we'll definitely talk a little bit about utilities. And that's definitely a big part of, you know, kind of our concern and just in general, the political issues going on in the state of New Mexico right now and around, and around our country with regard to electricity prices, electricity reliability, and, uh, you know, climate change, all that kind of good stuff. But uh, there's a few very newsworthy items. First and foremost, uh, you are, are a five-person body currently, and you recently switched uh, chair chair people. Uh, you went from uh, Basinti 
Aguilar. She was the chair to uh, former state representative or state uh, senator Steve Fishman. He's down in Las Cruces. And uh, you know, talk a little bit about the relevance or uh, importance and what happened with with that issue. Uh, Vicente Aguilar was considered, at least in the media stories I saw, uh, someone who's especially outspoken, which isn't necessarily the, the style of PRC commissioners in general and the body itself. Uh, but talk about that switch. Well, the commissioners that instigated it had reason, um, and I don't disagree with their reasons. They believe that the commission, that Commissioner Vicente Aguilar was going above and beyond the duties of chair. Um, we're all just one vote. You know, the chair just kind of officiates the meetings, but we're still equal votes. And I don't disagree with their assessment that, that she had in, in cases gone above her, her duties as chair. Um, but I don't believe it, it was reason enough to remove her from chair, especially just a few months before the regular election would come up in January. So I voted no to remove her, we vote, voted no against Commissioner Fishman. And it's not that I don't like Commissioner Fishman. I just didn't agree with the whole process. So I was a no vote on both of those. But it was just, you know, you could also chalk it up to election year politics being played right there. The three that voted for it were also in favor of moving us to appointed. And the two of us who are against it are adamantly opposed to appointed. Okay. Well, um, you know, I, I figure there's definitely some behind the scenes uh, personality challenges and conflicts and the PRC has definitely been at the eye of the storm uh, in a lot of these issues. And, you know, I know chair people uh, don't necessarily have more say overall about the issues and thanks for sharing your own personal stances on those. Well, aside from the recent shift in, in the chair of the PRC, uh, you all are facing some real challenges, just finding a place to meet and uh, kind of carrying out your duties in the state of New Mexico. Uh, and the governor has essentially kicked you out of your office space. Talk a little bit about that situation. Well, back in March, we received a letter or eviction notice, basically, um, we, we discussed it with them. We asked if they actually had authority to do so because in the letter they stated that our term was up. But when we looked at the documentation we had, we have until 22 uh, in that specific building before our, our term would have been up. And so there was those discussions and then, well, where would we go? We have a hundred and we'll say 140 staff members that need a house. And they weren't providing us with anywhere to go. They still haven't, as you said. Um, but we have just recently received grant funding to purchase or lease a space starting January 1. And we are mostly out of the building. We had to be out by the end of this month. She had told us by the end of June we asked for a, an extension because of all the COVID closures. We couldn't actually physically move out of the building because she had everything closed down, completely closed down. And so they allowed us to wait until now, the end of September. Um, the biggest problem we're dealing right now is our hearing examiners and all the business of the commission continues to move. They, we couldn't stop government. And we don't have any place to do hearings. They're being forced to do them over Zoom, WebEx, whatever internet platform is available. And they're very limited in, in the ability to, to perform a hearing. It's a court case, right? And it's hard to object in a system where you're muted. <laughs> so they have to unmute everybody. And then you have the, to deal with all the background noise that comes with everybody being unmuted, you know? So it's just added extra 
difficulty for our hearing examiners to perform their duties. I think they're the ones who are the most put out by the current situation. Um, you know, our meetings are live over WebEx. They're now going to be on YouTube for those who just want to watch it, but not actually participate. And that'll be easier for them. But it, there's challenges, as I was saying before, we've had to completely shut our meeting down and re-log on, everybody log back on because of the tech, the technology connections within the system fail, as everybody knows. So anyway, working from, this is my office, which is my car. And the reason I sit in my car is this is where I have the best service. I don't have cable here at my home. I have a uh, wireless internet, LAN. And everybody's having to deal with that that kind of situation where do you work when you don't have a place to work from so just talk a little bit about the legitimacy of this i mean you guys are a constitutionally uh, authorized entity uh, isn't the governor responsible at least if not in law at least uh, morally and why isn't she being held accountable for not authorizing or not offering uh, some space. I mean, you guys are elected officials. You're part of the New Mexico government. Uh, it would seem that somebody, especially the media, but in general, people should be you know, talking about this loudly and often the way she, the, the governor is handling this situation. I agree. It has been handled very poorly. Um, and the news media really hadn't covered it. The first time a story came out was about three weeks ago in the Albuquerque Journal. But as I said, we've been talking about this in our public meetings since March. Where are we going to go? How are we going to do it? How are we going to pay for it? That's another issue that we have to deal with because nowhere in our budget do we allocate $800,000 for lease space. And so how can we spend that, especially with the legislature now telling us don't spend any money you don't absolutely have to. Um, we are the only agency in the country that we have been able to identify that has ever been homeless. There is no front door for the Public Regulation Commission of New Mexico that a constituent, a concerned individual can go to and, and come in and, and file a complaint about something. And that's, to me, that's, that's crazy that the people of New Mexico are not afforded at least some office space that um, the constituents in New Mexico have, have a door to go to. You know, I know we're all using the phone and stuff, but there is a lot of complaints that people feel more comfortable putting in person. And right now that we don't have that door. And that that is a concern uh, to me that we're kicking out the people of New Mexico from accessing their government. Um, have other in the future uh, been more been vocal in their uh, concerns about this? I mean, let's face it, you're one of the more conservative, if not the most conservative member of the PRC. And, uh, you know, you're, you're maybe not as inclined towards uh, being deferential to the governor, who's a Democrat. And, uh, you know, the more of the PRC commissioners tend to be uh, of her ideological mindset. So, you know, maybe it, they're not willing to rattle the cage, so to speak. They aren't. Well, all of them aren't. There's a couple that they're hoping that maybe they'll be on that list of appointees, you know, and so they don't want to burn that bridge. And, and I guess I can understand that. I know I'm not going to be on that list for this governor. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't worry about that. I've been, there's been talk among representative senators and our own staff that we probably would have had grounds for a suit, a lawsuit, but there was never the will of the commission as a body to do that. Uh, we, we had those discussions a couple of times, but just couldn't get the comfort level up high enough that enough commissioners were willing to take a bite of that apple. Um, 
but I am surprised how many people do know about it. I've had commissioners from other states before it was even in the news in other states asking about that. How could we be kicked out of office space? And one of them even commented, she's from uh, Oklahoma, which is also a constitutionally mandated commission. She's, and she says that we're constitutionally mandated. They couldn't just kick us out of a building, you know? And I, well, we, we are too, but unless somebody's willing to step up and stop it, Supreme Court, legislature, somebody, it, it just doesn't happen. And that's what the situation we're in right now is nobody will buck the trend of this current governor. Yeah, well, that has been a common characteristic of this entire COVID-19 situation. I realize your situation is completely separate from that. But interestingly enough, uh, I know you probably remember, I don't know if you remember the exact date, but it was March the 11th when we very randomly encountered each other at a uh, burger joint in Las Cruces. That was kind of, to me, the uh, beginning day of the uh, COVID-19 kind of, as we know it, the lockdowns really got underway. That was uh, the announcement of the cancellation of the Bataan death march uh, uh, run or race or whatever that was that day the NBA season canceled that day and uh, there was a lot of uh, very important events that have led us you know over six months to where we are now in the virus situation and uh, your your PRC deal uh, your situation with the lack of office space got started at that point as well so uh, hard to believe and uh, it's been quite a long time uh, i'm sure folks can appreciate just uh feeling how long that period of time has been in their own personal lives but uh i there's a lot we want to talk about and uh the next issue that i want to address and the, the real grande foundation has taken a position we don't see this as a core limited government issue people of good um you know good uh, feelings on both sides can uh, ha- have different opinions in terms of the constitutional amendment that's on the ballot, uh, which would reconstitute your agency, the PRC, the commission, uh, and make it a appointed body with three members on it, as opposed to a five member elected body. Uh, I do know that you've taken a position counter that. So, uh, Tell us you know, what, why you think it's important that the commission be re, uh, constituted as it is now, as opposed to the uh, constitutional amendment. Well, I, I believe we should vote no on amendment one. There's a couple of reasons. One is that we're going from five elected by the people that have districts, so the whole state has representation, to three appointed by the governor, no districts. So as was, was as was happening before, we end up with representation out of Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and the rest of the state. The constituents of the rest of the state don't have any way to express their grievances. And I'll give you an example here. Just recently, a towing company was ordered a cease and desist by our staff doing their job. They called me and got me involved in that I questioned what was going on and and it took us a couple days, but we got them reinstated because it wasn't that the company was doing something that was a health and safety issue. They weren't about to kill somebody, right? It was just a matter of paperwork not being right. And it wasn't that the company didn't want to comply. They had thought and they had been told that they were in compliance for five years, since 2014, six years. They didn't know that they weren't in compliance and our our staff had not noticed a lapse in information. And so they got a cease and desist, which puts them out of business effectively until a hearing occurs and stuff like that. And we got it reinstated because like I said, they were just want, they want to comply. They want to be in business. If they didn't have somebody to call, if enemy D comes in and does that, who do you call? You call your representative, your senators, and they try to help you, but they don't have any authority to change a decision. An elected commissioner does. And why would we want to change from 
represented for the people to a, a larger bureaucracy. And they're always trying to move government to bureaucracy and remove accountability. And I, I can use OCD on an example where we had a, an site inspector who did not know what he was doing. He, he thought cooling towers were totes. He thought the rocks, native rocks on the ground was desert paving. You know, he clearly didn't understand the Southwest. He wasn't from here anyway, but they'd hired him in and he didn't know what he was supposed to be inspecting. And so he ends up relying on me, the person he should be checking to make sure I'm doing things properly to explain to him how things are done. And I couldn't call his boss and say, hey, we have a problem with this. Let's get this changed. We did call the boss, but nothing happened. We still ended up with that inspector. And the other reason they're giving that we need appointed commissioners is they're stating that it's because we're not qualified. While the legislature has a mechanism to set standards as to who can qualify to be a commissioner, but they choose not to enforce that. They've left that open so that anybody could run as a commissioner. They don't need to change the constitution to do that. All they have to do is go in, clean up the language and the legislation, and that could be done. And we don't require our land commissioner to be qualified. We don't require our treasurer, our auditors, there's no qualification requirements except to be a registered voter in the state of New Mexico. And for governor, all you have to do is live, live here for five years, but there's no qualifications for quite possibly the, the most important job in the state of New Mexico. So I disagree with the argument that qualifications are an issue, but I, I don't, because I know they can fix it. My biggest concern is why would we give up our right to choose our representation in Santa Fe and allow them to grow a bureaucracy that is unaccountable to the people? Yeah, I, uh, I totally understand those, but let's, uh, let's push back on a few of them. One is, uh, you know, that while you are uh, elected, very few people, you could probably poll New Mexicans and find that five uh, percent maybe less than that know who their commissioners are and commission being a commissioner in one of these public agencies isn't like being a state representative or state senator or even governor it's a much more you know judicial type uh, job so why not have those people accountable through the governor as opposed to, um, you know, where you're electing somebody based on, maybe I know Jeff Bird and he's a great guy. I want him to be my commissioner or, you know, whoever else it might be. Uh, the amount of folks who really know who their commissioners are and understand what the commission even does and how their vote impacts things, it, it's so outside of their knowledge base that uh, there really isn't that much accountability. Well, I guess nobody's ever said that being a voter doesn't take a responsible group electorate, right? And we, we try to make sure that the people who are voting and doing the voting are educated on all of the issues, which is why you and I are talking about the amendment issue today, is to help people get fully educated and get both sides of the story. And, and that's what we should be doing. Um, but again, if it's good for one, one branch of government, shouldn't all of those positions have some qualification requirements, minimum standards that are applied in order to be a candidate for the, for the position? And I'm not saying that shouldn't be. And the legislature has the ability to do that now without going through this whole amendment process. So clearly it isn't about qualifications or they would have done it because they have the power to do it. This is about gaining control. As the governor said, I want control because they won't do what I want. 
And that is a problem. You talk to commissioners that have been appointed and on appointed commissions, and they will tell you, they hear fellow commissioners say, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna do what my governor wants. And that is an issue. And I know that elected people won't always do what the people elected them there to do. But the next election, there's that opportunity to get them out. And once they're appointed, they're there for six years. So beyond the life of that governor, a governor can control a commission for 12 years, even though they're no longer governor. And so if you have bad appointments, you can end up with them for 12 years. Right. Um, so, you know, in a, in a normal election year with kind of the normal interest groups on both sides of the issue, uh, and, and again, the PRC is a very important, very powerful uh, entity, you would expect some pretty significant campaign ad spending. Uh, but I haven't seen a single ad on either side, either pro-constitutional amendment or anti-constitutional amendment uh, on TV or op-eds in the paper. Uh, it just seems that there's generally, and, and I know that the legislation in the, uh, when the legislature passed the constitutional amendment, the process requires vote of the people. Uh, so it, both entities have to play out, but there hasn't been much discussion of this thing uh, and advocating for one side or the other. Uh, so far, do you expect any interest groups to play on one or the other side of this issue? So there's been at least four mailers in favor of amendment number one. Uh, the PAC that is putting out those mailers is not registered with Secretary of State. And we, I have been told by another a think tank here in New Mexico that the money is coming from out of state. Um, and they are expecting them to spend money on radio and television as we get closer to election day. Those of us that are opposed to it don't have money available, I guess, except for our own time and energy. I have been traveling around the state. I've been doing phone calls such as this. I will be on other radio programs talking about the issue. And there are other people doing the same thing who are in opposition, but we don't have a, a war chest to, to do mailers or commercials or anything like that. So our venue is, is radio, newspaper op-eds, and uh, maybe a television spot or two. All right. Well, I will eagerly await a uh, pro PRC in the, in the current uh, formulation op-ed in the, the journal or the Santa Fe, New Mexican. And, you know, we'll see how things shake out on election day. Uh, yes. But there are some more issues we want to discuss. And specifically, uh, you know, we, you talked about electricity earlier and how big of a part of your work that is. Uh, the PRC has weighed in specifically on renewable portfolio standards and uh, those, you know, whether under Bill Richardson, which got us to 20% renewables uh, this year, or moving forward, the effort to make New Mexico 100% reliant on uh, traditionally renewable electricity, that being wind and solar with batteries uh, as a part of that. Uh, talk about that particular issue, uh, the Energy Transition Act and the PRC's role in it. And uh, I, I know you have prohibitions again, speaking about ongoing issues, but the PRC did say 100% renewable for PNM. Is that going to be adopted as the final, uh, final, final, or where, where's PNM? Does PNM have to respond to that? So talk a little bit about uh, those issues at the PRC that you can. So we did approve the closure of San Juan, which is what was required in the Energy Transition Act. And we have approved replacement technologies. Um, we, we found the option that best met every requirement that was put in the bill. 
And there was many requirements in that bill that they expected to see. Uh, making sure that school district near the San Juan Generating Station's bonds remained solvent. You know, they were able to pay their bills. That was a very important issue. Um, and so enough technology had to be placed in that school district's tax base to keep that going. We had to make sure that there was enough generation to offset what they're going to lose. Um, the problem with the alternative energy sources is that they're unreliable. Uh, the battery does help in peak six situations. And that's what that's going to help is on those hot days in the afternoons, those cold mornings in the summer, in the winter, excuse me. Um, and there's an extra power draw. The batteries can help provide that for a few hours until the other energy producers get back online, the solar and the wind. Um, we went with a specific, and it was surprising to me that it was a 5-0 vote. I'll be honest with you. I didn't expect a 5-0 vote. Um, one of the screwy things about being a commission is we can't just sit down and have conversations with one another about decisions we're about to make. Um, we kind of feel each other out. Like me and one other commissioner, we might talk a little bit, but we can't as a group talk about it. So I was actually surprised that it was a 5-0 vote. One of the reasons that I supported it was that it was the one of the best options that allowed San Juan and Enchant to succeed at their carbon capture and keep that plant open. And the reason that is, is that it removed PNM from the facility so that they would no longer need the transmission lines, the tie-in lines and everything that was there. Um, and so that would, that gave all that space available for Enchant to get that energy into the into the system. And that was gonna be one of their, their deals. If, if we put, one of the other options was to put 11 gas generating stations there, right there at the facility. And that would have pretty much nixed any chance of, of Enchant. And as we move down the, the scale, the better Enchant's chance was. Um, but this isn't 100% for PNM. They also own part of Palo Verde, the nuclear station in Arizona. And so it, it's a firm power source and they're gonna, they're gonna have to rely on it in those times when the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining. Um, and during peak, they'll be able to rely on Palo Verde to provide the power to keep their system up and running. Uh, in the future, we may be looking at some gas peakers, some quick start gas plants that can come on i'm also on spp the southwest power pool yeah let and me that, clear up a few things jeff before we leave that one alone because as i understand it the prc said 100 percent renewable not 100 percent carbon free now uh, maybe i'm not as well versed in the inner workings of utilities and whatnot but to me 100 percent Renewable means if it's not wind and solar or maybe, you know, geothermal or, or uh, hydro, it's not going to be used to power the light switch or the light, the light in my house, the air conditioning in my house, the business, et cetera. Um, am I missing something? What, what's the discrepancy there? So the plan that we approved is a hundred percent alternative. I don't, I don't use renewable because. Sure. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but just so everybody understands, we're talking, this, we're saying the same thing. Right. Um, what we approved was 100% alternative energies, but PNM still has vested interest in Palo Verde, which is the nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. And they also have, as you said, the geothermal, which is another alternative, but they do have other energy sources on their portfolio. And so, until they decide to get rid of Palo Verde, which they'll have to come and ask, and, and we'll have to figure out what to do with it at that time. But right now, it's just what we approved was 100% alternative. So it was wind, solar, and battery. Right. I still don't, I'm, I'm still, 
missing something here because yes, you approved. And w- when is it a hundred percent renewable or alternative buy? What, what is the date which that is supposed to 45, th- I believe 2045. Okay. That's, that's why I understood. And, and is this the final, is this the plan or is there the P and M go along with this or where, where's this process at? So PNM is working on their CNNs, their certificates for construction on these. And that's something that's going to come up. What they have released to the press is they are happy with the decision. Okay. But well, that is actually something that the details, we still have to iron that out. So, all right. Th- thank you for that. And that answers a couple of important questions I had, but, uh, uh, so the year is 2046. Theoretically, PNM is is totally out of renewable, or maybe they are into renewable. They're totally out of coal and natural gas and everything else, so far as New Mexico goes. But may, you know, they're a big company. They have interests in Texas, and maybe they, you know, buy some interest in another state, and they're using uh, nuclear power for those areas. So you're telling me that if they have a problem, P&M can still use nuclear or other forms of electricity that are technically not adhering to the 100% renewable uh, standard in 2046, potentially. Is that that what I'm gathering? I'm trying to figure this all out. So as as technology currently stands, we'll not be able to go to 100%. Sure, um, I agree with you. So we're going to have gas peaker generators, something that can come on quick, and in a few seconds they're generating power. Um, technology is going to change, and that's 25 years from now. We don't know what batteries are going to look like, what the technology is going to be, but we know the wind's not always going to blow and the sun's not always going to shine. So there has to be a way to provide power at, during those times. Um so PNM has to rely on, like I said, they're, they're going to have to rely on Palo Verde to provide power at times. And right now it's in their portfolio to do so. Um, so, but it comes up here pretty soon. So we'll see what they're going to propose. Uh, I know there's going to be opposition. There's going to be people who want to get out of that. Um, but for the reliability issue, you know, that, that is a big concern for me. If you don't have some firm power, something that can always make electricity at all times of the day in all weather conditions, people don't want rolling brownouts and they definitely don't want blackouts. So we have to have firm power in some shape, form or fashion. And PNM has it so far and in the foreseeable future, they'll have to have it. All right. So hypothetically, and maybe this is dangerous ground, but I'm going to ask, anyway so uh hypothetically based on this decision as you said uh same one generating station could in fact be used by uh whoever its owner in the future is if enchant energy is that owner that they get the carbon sequestration going and and that's working out well there'll be a merchant power plant and then new mexico say we run into problems we need some electricity to keep the grid afloat at a time of uh, uh, you know wind and solar aren't cutting the mustard and the the batteries aren't working as well as we'd hoped so are you saying that we could buy that electricity theoretically from san juan generating station yeah and and the way the market is um pnm's working on we approved earlier this year late last year for them to join the western uh energy market and and I had mentioned I'm part of SPP, which is Southwest Power Pool, which is another energy market that has 16 states. New Mexico is part of it. Um, when you're in those markets, you can kind of think of the, the grid is just a big tank and everybody's pumping into that tank. And in order to rem- keep these brownouts from happening, what they have to do is, is just re-divert down lines to send power in where it's where it's not being provided adequately um when you look at these models 
that show the grid of America and, and the, the transmission lines everywhere. And they can actually measure when lines are, are about to hit peak and when they're running low and reroute, reroute energy into given areas. The Permian Basin is a great example. There are high energy consumption here the last few years, all the new oil wells, the drilling, everything going on. And so they put it, brought in some more high voltage lines and they can route it from different facilities to get the power into the areas that need it. And PNM's on the same, same kind of system. They're, we're all on the same grid, but they're in the Western grid, but their switch stations, there's one in Clovis, New Mexico, and SPS could, in theory, sell power from any of their stations that has ex excess power, run it through that switch station, which just changes the hertz, and sell it to PNM to provide power anywhere they need it. And so that's part of the grid modernization that's going on. Um, you know, we some places have abundance of wind and maybe blowing like crazy in Kansas and dead calm here in New Mexico. And they're able to ship power down that away through various transmission lines uh, to make sure that our power needs are met. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, it's just, uh, you know, talking 100% uh, renewable, whatever you call it. And the application thereof is a little different. And I, intrigued by that wiggle room uh now well i agree 100 percent. just didn't at current technology is not attainable but let's see what the next 10 15 years brings us now el paso electric serves a lot of folks down in las cruces in the southern part of the state they haven't had to my knowledge a similar hearing before the prc is that something that is in the works for them as well and uh, you know, they have a nuclear plant that's going to be much more of a factor as far as the percentage of their electricity generation from what I uh, have read. Uh, do they have to adhere to the 100% or is that a P&M uh, only regulation? Can you walk me through that? And we've only got a few minutes to go, but I, I know it's complicated stuff. But if you can help me understand that situation, that'd be great. So all power providers have to provide electricity that is from 100% alternative source. That's what the law says, 100% alternative sourced energy. Um, so what they may be doing is buying power, buying power out of Kansas off the wind generation farms up there. And it's being pumped into a tank. Like I said, it all goes into the big tank, which is the grid, the electric grid. and there's power being provided to the homes in Albuquerque or the homes in Las Cruces or the homes in Roswell. Where that power actually comes from, you can't identify. Whether it's coming from a coal plant in Texas or the wind farms in Kansas, we don't know. But who's getting the money are the ones specified by the law, which will be the alternative energy source companies. Is that... That, so that, everybody's just pumping into the into this tank of water and, and we're dipping into that tank of water and tanking a drink. We really don't know where those molecules came from, right? We just know it's water and it's keeping me hydrated. Well, it just shows you that uh, a lot of those claims of 100% renewable electricity that companies make and other folks make uh, really don't hold up under greater scrutiny. That's what it tells me. You know, Facebook... Yeah, when yeah. Facebook, Google, Walmart claim they're 100%, unless they are physically isolated from the grid, they, they can't actually say with all 100% accuracy that absolutely none of those electrons came from a, a coal-fired plant. Right. And of course, it's not just about the, uh, you know, the electrons themselves, it's the timing thereof. And, and that's where the real challenge comes in for the grid uh, managers and, and the actual producers of electricity because you have to have the backup power or something in place or the lights just don't stay on. And that's a, that is a real problem for electricity providers, PNM, uh, El Paso Electric and others and potentially customers. And we talked about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis California on the last podcast with Rob Nicoleski. And uh, uh, anyway, 
uh, Jefferson uh, Commissioner Byrd, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I think you've enlightened me for sure, and hopefully the listeners to the show. And uh, uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? My phone number is 575-361-0212. And it's on over 10,000 business cards across the state. So I don't mind handing that out. That's my cell phone. If I don't recognize the number, you better leave a message. I might not call you back. I get tons of spam calls. No doubt. Well, you guys got to crack down on that there at the PRC, right? Isn't that your purview? We, uh, no, not really. Um, so we do some of the small telephone companies, but not, not the big national ones. All right. Sounds good. And there's a lot we didn't get to, but, uh, you know, we, uh, I think fleshed out some very important issues during this, uh, 40, 45 minute long conversation. Uh, definitely, uh, interested more details on broadband and other, uh, regulations and, and aspects of what the PRC is doing, but thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to get the latest edition of tipping point, New Mexico by subscribing to Apple podcast, Stitcher and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.